you just have to pull yourself together and say, right, exactly. do it, and, but do it better. Now is the crisis opportunity. So, Maybe Jason, this yes. podcasting Tim. is fantastic. Oh, thanks, I mean, man. I'm so, I'm, I'm proud of you, man. You just, thanks so much, you. dude. Such a go-getter. Have you, have you had a chance to, um, to uh, listen to any of them yet? Yeah, I listened to um, Hawk and uh, another director. We haven't had much time, but I've been wanting to yeah. see your sort of how you, your conversation stuff. So it's great. It's really yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Thank awesome, you, man. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm going to try and roll out three episodes of YouTube a week on wow. top of the two episodes of podcast. And God, it's a lot of work, in it? In it. Right. Just the simplest things. Yeah, it can take can hours. Get into that. Whoa, yep. Oh, my gosh. Do you remember that Charlie Brooker video? For, uh, making television is as easy as falling off a log. Oh, no. No, I'm no? You have to see that. It's a video he made with uh, Screen Wipe years ago. Mm -hmm. And he does a shot in front of the camera. He goes, making TV is as easy as falling off a log. And then spends the next 10 minutes explaining why it isn't. And the release forms you have to get. And the log, and it's raining, and he couldn't. So he had to do this, and he had to green screen. Mm -hmm. And that it just becomes this amazing epic story of, then you realize that it's just, yeah. TV is nothing as easy. No. Well, nothing, nothing worth doing is easy. Right. Right? Yeah, exactly. I'd hope. I hope. There are a lot of easy things. It's when you care and when you want it done right that you, you spend three hours, but you thought would take five minutes, but it still feels only about half an hour. Mm. It's just that when you're into it, you, you go in the extra mile and then, yeah. Well, what's it? Tony Robbins says, I don't know if you're into Tony Robbins or anything, but Tony Robbins will say that perfectionism is like the, is the, um, the great hindrance of progress. Because it just, if you try and get too perfect, it's never going to be perfect. So the more you try and be perfect, the, the less likely you are to actually make progress. So meaning perfect, like that's exactly how I want it. Uh, yeah. And I'm satisfied. Yeah. 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 Can't. So, yeah. So example, say you were to make 10 videos and those 10 videos um, struck a chord with 10% of people but they took a tenth of the time it took you to make one video. You're now, you've now got 10 videos out making an impact on 100 people, for example. Let's keep the numbers right. rounded. Yeah. So, yeah. Whereas you could, do, you could make one video that impacts 100 people, but that's it. That's its shelf life is for 100 people. Whereas your other things that you've gone, you've done 10 things. So now you, you've actually made a lot of progress in yourself as well. You've learned by making those 10 videos. So you're further on in the process. The learning, the doing and learning has been the most important thing, I think, for me. And I've gone through different stages of it. And the most recent one was COVID. Because of lockdown, I've had to go live a lot more. Mm -hmm. That really peeled back another layer of learning. That I, I, I thought I was ready for it because I've done the years of making the videos, presentations where you can edit the video and you have control. But live presentation mode is one of the hardest things to do in the world, I think, more than acting, more than performing on stage or anything. But, but when you have to be, or even comedy. I remember I did stand-up comedy years ago, and that was hard. But presenting, where you have to be professional, can't fall apart, you have to be on message, entertaining as well, and you put so many expectations on yourself to be professional – but I think that creates a rigidity, I realized, when you're in live mode. You have to actually be a bit more human and loose. So Yeah, I think people kind of I think people are, are let you get away with a bit more. But mm. also when you do go live, people try to catch you out a lot more too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's, it's a They try and sword. get you, you know. They try and get you. It's like, you know, you've got a couple of people on the very first time you went to a subscription model for the right roast. Yeah, you had some people going. Oh, yeah. So, what's this channel going to be about then? Is it just going to be ads for the Right Row subscription service? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right, and it's like instead of getting that on the comments, you'll get that live, and then they just watch you to see how you react. Like, yeah, how's he going? How's Tim going to handle this one? Yeah, go on then, Tim. 
Well, I had a bigger version of that when we became a marketplace. So in 2019, when we actually launched Right Roast Marketplace, we were for five years before then just entertainers making videos, um, being reporters of specialty coffee. So the moment we switched to marketeers, a lot of people in the community were sort of like, well, what's in it for me? And what are you offering that's special now? And we became sort of immediately judged for our offering, forgetting the history and all the love and attention that we were giving specialty coffee roasters. Suddenly, some of the community was saying, right, well, what have you got that's any different? And uh, we weren't able to convince certain people because what's a complicated thing with specialty coffee? There's international shipping. And when you buy wine from abroad, you're willing to spend hundreds of pounds for these rare wines. But coffee isn't like that. You're spending maybe 10, 15 pounds on a bag. So to have shipping be more than the coffee itself, suddenly it it doesn't really work. So people were saying, well, why, why, what are you offering that's new? And we've Mm. had to prove a point to a lot of people who judged us because we became marketeers and no longer just commentators. Yeah, yeah. So when you say people, are you talking about the roasters and all those people? Or the, or the, um, the, the purchasers? The purchasers, people we thought would champion what we did, yeah, right, were suddenly judging us a bit <laughs> rather harshly. I think, <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude, it's hilarious though, isn't it? When you take a step back, you just go, "That's that's so funny," because I was saying to I was saying to my girlfriend last night, you know, that obviously on this journey to um create and be a content creator of my interests and all that kind of jazz the the as you as you are fully aware you have to put in so many hours and you do the so many hours for free and there is not one whilst i'm not rushing to monetize anything at this point in time i will not feel guilty when i do so not in a million years (laughs) because it's like dude it dude it's done like nine till three a.m pal i think i'm all right <laughs> i think i'm okay i think i can charge whatever i like <laughs> you know because i know that the whatever that price is whatever the product is it's the right it's price sweat equity it's yeah it's the, the the time you put in that you do if you do it for love and one day you want to monetize it i think as long as you're continuing to do it for love you don't switch and suddenly just want to do it for money that's right then yeah let it ride yeah, so so key, isn't it? As long as you keep that. I was speaking to a chap called Andy Hodgson the other day, and um, I think it's, it's the latest episode actually. And he talks about like that pure joy, you know, staying with the pure joy of why you did it in the first place. And um, I kind of it was kind of interesting because within the conversation, he was getting all excited about it, like when he first told me about his pure joy of when his parents went to sleep, he would sneak off into his room and have the radio on low. He's a radio presenter and he'd have the radio on low and like listen to late night, like talk shows on the radio. And then like created this like persona of himself called Ricky sky. And he'd record (laughs) his like shows, but um, even all the 30 years later, he's still doing it, you know? So. Wow. Well, that's, yeah, that's getting in touch with the inner child and yeah. Pick a job you love and you'll never work another day is something that I think it, it matters to me more than I think the average person because uh, I've had to reinvent myself switching into coffee. I, I kind of look back now and I can see that coffee really saved me mm-hmm. in terms of my career path because for years I was heading down a totally different path. I was a filmmaker mm-hmm. and filmmaking was my thing. I wanted to be a director. I became a TV director, a producer director, an editor, an edit producer. I think I didn't, I've had maybe 14 different career titles in the world of television. And the problem is, is I didn't, that wasn't kind of what I went into media for. I went to film school and imagined that I'd go into film and TV and be sort of a director or maybe an editor and director because I loved it. I love editing, Mm -hmm. but then the world changed and it became very digital in the nineties. 
And uh, I wasn't quite prepared for that switch. So um, it didn't suit me very well. I didn't realize. I can reflect now and say this. After my years in coffee, it's really great that I can look back now and analyze this because the fit wasn't quite right for many reasons. And it's partly because of me. I was diagnosed with ADHD about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I realized mm -hmm. that it was tough for me to kind of get a focus on an industry that was fragmenting in front of me. And the, the sort of digitization of, of filmmaking made it sort of everyone's game. And um, I was still an, a kind of old school thinker in filmmaking. I wanted to shoot on film. I wanted it to be an expensive, difficult process to separate the boys from the men. And uh, <laughs> suddenly everybody doing it with video cameras made it just difficult for me to rise above that. And uh, so I decided to take on these different roles in television. And it did, but I, I realized more and more that I wasn't building a career that mm. I felt was satisfying. So, um, yeah, quite despondent until I found coffee as the focus to be consistent with. Mm -hmm. And whilst I was still working in television, I was making these videos in coffee about seven years ago. But I, I didn't realize it at the time, but subconsciously I was trying to give up that career and find one thing I had control of and focus on. And that's why coffee saved me because it's given me that focus and control. And it's, 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 it's liberating because it suits me as well. Being my own boss, ADHD was a real challenge by working for other people that way. So yeah, it's been a strange path, but really interesting. one. Yeah, that's lovely. I remember you, um, <laughs> we, maybe it was even one of the last times I actually saw you in the flesh, but I remember you telling me about this idea. Really? Yeah, I remember it. And we were, we were at a party and you said, you were like, I've got this idea and I want to go and um, review coffees. And they're just going to be really short, short, snappy videos, like one minute, two minute videos of like concise review of a coffee, bing, bing, bing. And I was like, yeah, yeah that's absolutely, dude, you've got to do that. That's great. And your reasoning for it was like that there was too much sort of like long winded kind of stuff. And, you know, you just want to get into it kind of thing. And, um, and sure enough, you did it. You did it. And then it was like, I think it was like a couple of weeks later, the first episodes were going out and that That's was crazy. Yeah. And I remember that, but <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes you just need like to, to go and just to take action on the idea. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm pretty sure just whatever I had said, it doesn't. I'm not like trying to take credit for the right roast here, but I mean, I just mean that you know, you you took action on it, which was awesome, 10%. awesome to see. Well, yeah. thank you. I mean, it, I, at the time, can you remember that? By the way, can you remember? It, that? I think I, I remember talking to you about it. Yeah, it, it was I in Highbury and Islington. Specifically, the wow. party was in Highbury and Islington, above a pub. Wow. Well. It's incredible because those videos were just a small piece of this jigsaw. If I yeah. knew back then the workload that I was committing, to, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I swear. Really? This is like, yeah. I mean, we have done probably in the last two years, 10 years worth of work. We have gotten up so early and gone to bed so late every single day. And yeah. COVID has just made it. So there's no distractions and no yes. excuses. Yes. We were quite That's behind in many ways. So when COVID hit, the world slowed down and allowed us to catch up in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So what's your routine? What's your daily routine? Up at 9 a.m., which sounds late, but we get really. the, day, the day gets going at 10, mm -hmm. but it usually wraps up at about 1.30, 2 a.m. Okay. Just, that's, that's all right. That's quite, it's a long day on, on a, one topic and, and that jazz, isn't it? It's not enough. We're always going to bed thinking, oh my God, we're always looking at the watch at 5 p.m. and going, yeah, how yeah. fast did it get to five? And then yeah. at 8 p.m., it's a real shock daily that it's 8 p.m. because it still feels like 3 or 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. And there's just too much to do. So, mm -hmm. um, 
but it's enjoyable. I mean, I love that we're that busy. We're just self-creating. Yeah, that's awesome. Really I cool. I think the, the other thing I should mention Go on. is that um, the biggest ingredient in all of this is, um, is Ico, mm -hmm. because she is the great actualizer of all of this. I, I would just be a pile of ideas. I've had so many ideas over the years of things I wanted to do and things I wanted to be, and some of them good ideas, some of them bad, but because of the ADHD, you have these ideas, but you can't follow through on any of them. So mm -hmm. when the coffee one came up, it could have been just another one of those things that I talked to friends about, like you at a party, and then next year it's, oh, now I'm doing this other thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because Aiko really, she just knew how to kind of keep me focused and do all these other things that make it happen as well. Because for the 20% that I do in front of the camera, there's the 80% that she's doing with me behind the camera. Then it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing. I mean, people don't really realize that. I mean, without the power and strength of what she does, just produce and run and photograph and media and everything, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. I that's awesome. That. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. You have to say that why? Because she's behind the camera going, you better say that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Imagine. I, I have down. to say that. Yeah. She's like, yo, you better say, if you don't say it this time, buddy. Oh, I don't say funny. it anywhere. I, do, yeah. I just don't feel like I say it enough anywhere. Yeah. Uh, well, you'll never be able to say it enough because nobody will ever understand other than you how much those rocks in your life have actually do support. And there'll be many others that think they have supported you more than they have. Yeah. <laughs> That's a thing as well, isn't it? As you kind of plow through. Um, so obviously, as you've guessed, we've already started. Um, yeah. But uh, oh. yeah, well, we're, we've kind of, we just went into it. Um, <laughs> but do you want to like tell us a, a little bit of your, your story? You know, how it, how did it all begin in the blue bottle coffee shop in brooklyn sipping on your first filtered coffee right right that was the breakthrough moment nice well done Daniel Thanks, so. <laughs> so uh 2012 i had to take a friend to america help him out and then i went to new york and a friend took me to a cafe called blue bottle to have a coffee and Back then, in, in this part of Brooklyn, there was nothing around there. It was just a whole bunch of warehouses. And uh, this one cafe that was alone in a derelict neighborhood had a queue running all the way outside, around the block, of people waiting for coffee, which in itself was very interesting. And it, I wanted to try whatever this queue was. Mm -hmm. Must be a new thing. I didn't, I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to try it. And uh, when we got inside, I realized... The, the, why the queue was there was because brewing specialty coffee takes time. The way they do the pouring of the coffee and everything, it's a simple brew, but it, it takes a while. It's not something many cafes love to do is to serve pour over brews only. Because if yeah. you just have five, six people waiting in line and it takes four or five minutes per coffee, then the speed of espressos and cappuccinos is very attractive to cafes. But this was a new thing. So, there was long queues and I got fascinated by it all. And I love the simplicity that in the end, you just get a black coffee, but they're saying, but enjoy the flavor because the flavor is going to be even more enhanced. And I tried it and I loved it. And it was just this sort of wow moment where other people get it with wine. Some people get it with chocolate. I don't know, but there'll be something that triggers your taste buds maybe and your, your creativity and your excitement. I always loved coffee as a drink, but, Never in this way. And this was just a it, was a, it was a great moment where I discovered I was passionate about flavor and quality. And so I started to research more about it. And uh, yeah, it became an interesting thing. And it was very new. That was the other important zeitgeist thing, I think, in my life, is that I was feeling kind of empty and uh, creatively wondering where my career was going to go and somewhat adrift. And so discovering this drink and then a few months later starting to see, well, it wasn't a few months later, actually. It was a year later when I met Ico that we started to talk about, well, this, this new drink, specialty coffee, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Why don't we start making videos about it and being creative about it? And that sort of marriage of me being a bit lost creatively and co- specialty coffee being new, because if I had this epiphany today, I'd have to get in the back of the queue. Of a, there's a lot of media now out there. So by, by having right, yeah, yeah. fortuitous mm. awareness that this is new, this is special, and I already have the creative skills. I'm not 20 nothing without the ability to execute the necessaries. I was ready to go. And uh, Ico and I just got going straight away. And our first video was at a cafe called Proof Rock. Very cool cafe in, um, I forget which street. In it's East in London. Farringdon, isn't it? Yeah, Farringdon, uh, in the Market Street. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's a really cool cafe. And, and you did. got to meet him, didn't you? You got to meet the the founder at one point, right? Of Proof Rock. Yeah, didn't you? Yeah, didn't you yeah, him? he's a legend. Gwillem. Yeah, right. Gwillem Davies is a, a world barista champion, I think, from back in the early days, in 2008. Mm-hmm. And he, he's, uh, yeah, he's like a coffee legend. So mm-hmm. got to meet him at coffee festivals. I became just very nerdy about specialty coffee. Yes. So, it just suited me. It was all the timing and everything. And uh, yeah, it's great. Absol- look, absolutely. And you know what it is? It's film. It's film. That's what it is. Because it's like technical. And when you're doing all of the, the brewing and the, the, the two, th- I've seen you prepare your coffees. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, how many grams is that? Oh, that's 16.3. Okay, no, we've got to take some beans out, put it in. Okay, there's 16. Okay, da, da, da. Four, four four spins da, da, da. it's the film process isn't it it's that kind of it's that craft it's the art it's the dark art it's very true it's mm. it's both a barrier to entry in in specialty coffee but once you break through that barrier you then you love it because mm. you're following recipes and when you get such excellent flavors and it's it's different each week each month you're discovering new things it's a very dynamic relationship with specialty coffee not static with, with regular co- coffee, it's just a commodity drink. But with specialty coffee, you can't drink the same one next month because it's gone. It's out of season. So you start to enjoy all these sort of recipes and numbers and dialing things in because you, the rewards are so exciting. And uh, yeah, you're right. I didn't see it so much that way. But I even make comparisons to photography because mm-hmm. I learned about photography over the years. And uh, ISO, shutter speed, aperture, they have a relationship and you start to enjoy the numbers yeah. in photography. And uh, that's the same thing, I think, with coffee is you start pulling ratios and, and, and time and brewing. and Oh, definitely. And the gauges, you know, all of the microns. And the, when I first saw that gauge, what do you call it now? The brev, what's it called again? The, bru- the, br- the, the thing with all the of the gauges. A brewer, ah, yes. brewer. That's it. A brewer, brewer, like ruler, but for brews. Brewer, brewer. That's it. <laughs> so the first time I saw that, I was like, "What on earth is this? What is this?" I just thought that looks. If you weren't kind of so, that was the first. Okay, that was the second moment I've ever had kind of a moment like that in coffee. The first moment like that was in Canada in a coffee shop where they had this um, this kind of like weird distillery, but it was for coffee. Distillery? Yeah, it looked like a distillery. Wait, so it was like... A roasting so it, was, machine. it was... Oh, oh, wait. This is probably where they're on the farms, where they're processing the No, coffee. no, this is in a coffee shop. Distillery. And it was like, yeah, it, well, that's, no, it looked like it. So, so it was like this, you know, like an old school chemistry distillation set where they have all of the like evaporation and then it all like condenses and then it's like bing, drip, one like solitary drop drips over the coffee and then it's ding and it went down like this like spiral and then it went up the spout and then just like bing, one drop. And I was like, that machine <laughs> like is insane. That's you called a it siphon. Is? I know what you mean. Now. Siphon. It's called a siphon. And they right. put it on display. They use it for show. It takes right. a long time to brew. Uh, and uh, 
It's a lot of fun to watch, but if they made siphon coffees, the queues would be five times longer because <laughs> yeah. one coffee takes, I think it takes like a half an hour to make one. Yeah, I think somebody ordered it in there. We already had our coffee, drank it, <laughs> finished it, and the guy was still waiting. It was like, well, it looks awesome. <laughs> you know, uh, it you looks really cool. But I said, oh, how many of these are there? You know, and I think they had like rented it from some company in, in Italy. Mm. Um, there was like, the, the, they, they claimed at the time that they didn't make many of these in the world, but oh, this guy it, ran a club in, in, in London, a secret siphon club. It was called, he put it in right. a different location each month right. and you pop up, you bring your coffee beans along and you'll brew it up in the siphon. And it was a, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. well, that kind cool. of stuff goes on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Oh dear. Um, so yeah, you obviously fell in love with coffee back in 2012. Blue yeah. bottle. Did you drink coffee beforehand? I always loved coffee. I used to be a smoker. So coffee and cigarettes, diners, black coffee. I was there already. Filter mm -hmm. coffees in, in diners in America with this sort of mm -hmm. ordinary black coffee. They weren't very strong. It didn't taste amazing. They didn't get me excited. But I was already preconditioned to enjoy mm -hmm. filter coffee. A lot of people who get into specialty coffee, including... One of the most famous, his name is Tim Wendelbo. He's a sort of coffee legend, roaster in Norway. He famously doesn't like coffee, regular coffee. He, was a, he, he hated coffee. So specialty coffee is that different a drink from regular coffee, that you can be someone that doesn't like regular coffee and then just enjoy specialty. Mm. It, the right specialty coffee for me doesn't, it doesn't have any of that carbon taste, that burnt taste that coffee has. So the absence of any of that, I'm learning that for new people, the best way to present it is to say, I've got this new drink here. It's called, uh, uh, I don't know, brownie juice. Try it. And they don't even think of it as coffee. They, I think they'll enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But it's because they, you tell them it's coffee that they already have this idea in their head and it doesn't meet that. So they go, oh, it's weird. Oh, oh. All right. Yeah. I've got to almost come up with a new name for it and just say, try this drink and tell me what you think. And I think they'll like it more. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's part of our mission at, at the right roast is to sort of bring new people into specialty coffee. So. Oh, is it? That's your way. kind of, that's your, your mission statement as it were. I know that you're a lot about community. You have your, your kind of part slogan at times is what's it? Uh, content. Coffee community. Community. Yeah. It's a strong message because I think that coffee lovers, there is certainly a community about it, isn't there? There's definitely yeah. something to get behind with coffee that you don't really see with tea. Hence why there's so many coffee shops and there's not really a whole lot of tea shops, especially um, in, in the, in the West. Western world. Yeah, in the West. Yeah. yeah. Tea people are crazy for. And I don't, what I don't understand is two things. What, what people are crazy about herbal teas. You know, they, they are. I, f I don't find them interesting. But I also find interesting is why I don't. Mm -hmm. Because they're very similar drinks. I'm drinking a cup of coffee right now, this one. And the flavor notes in it are sort of jasmine, mandarin, sun-dried tomato, whatever. But these same things, these same flavors exist in teas. Mm. And they're very similar drinks. And yet, so far apart for me. I find that strangely fascinating. Yeah, that is quite fascinating. I guess like part of it is that, because is it a myth that there is, there's the same amount of caffeine, right? In a coffee as a tea, right? I, I or is it like different? But I like, don't know. Are, are you able to go to sleep now? You're, you're drinking a coffee at 20 to nine. Yeah. Are you, are you going to be able to get to sleep this evening? Well, I go to bed very late, so yeah. I start oh, try I to stop drinking coffee around now. Around now. But, <laughs> Is that why you just downed it? Like <laughs> No, 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 no. It's I ten think, to nine, you say. Look, look, look. I always keep a little bit in the glass, but I feel like I'm drinking a lot of coffee, but I'm not. I'm actually drinking about uh two cups worth a day. Mm -hmm. Broken up into about three or four little cups of sipping. Oh, I see. You do. If I don't little. like something, throw it away. I don't uh, want to get through the whole drink. And yeah. so I'm just brewing lots of little ones. And uh, yeah, my caffeine intake isn't, I don't want it to, to get too high. Like kind of buzzy. 
yeah. the buzzy, exactly. Like uh, the wine drinkers must spit it out if they're getting drunk, how they're really able to assess. So it's the same thing when you go to coffee cuppings where the rows of coffees around the tables, and people are spooning, sipping the different coffees. They always have a cup and they're <laughs> spinning it out in the cup. Oh, really? And they have these slurping sounds with their spoons. Right, the yeah, cup. the slurping spoon. Right here. Mm-hmm. That's what a cupping spoon looks like. And mm-hmm. uh, they sort of go like, and they have this slurp that sounds like a spaceship or something. <laughs> <laughs> they love to have these loud slurping sounds. Uh-huh. And then they spit it out in the cup. And uh, I just don't do that. I, I, I should, I know, but... Mm-hmm. I can understand that if you're doing a lot of tasting, you can get very caffeinated quickly. So, yeah. I guess it's like chefs, they end up being quite chubby, don't they? Because they have to, they keep on tasting the food all the time. So, wow. so that sort of classic thing of chefs can, can get a bit plump if they don't uh, keep on exercising. Just because, right. just, I mean, I guess it's just, yeah, little, they must have about a thousand different, you know, spoonfuls. And they have usually, especially speciality chefs, they'll have a lot of, uh, fat content won't they in there didn't think of that you're dishes. right oh my god they must become huge because it's just <laughs> yeah lots of little bites but all day <laughs> all day yeah they must have like you know ten thousand bites but, <laughs> oh my god. you know crazy right crazy <laughs> so um the reason obviously why we have you know some people might be listening going hold on a second what's it what's this coffee lover on a podcast called confident performance for but really principally it's you are the, the founder of The Right Roast. It's had an honorable mention thus far in the conversation, but what is The Right Roast? So it gave, you know, it was born out of uh, your idea, you and Ico's idea. What happened? It was born out of um, a desire to communicate to people the wonders of specialty coffee, but it sort of began as a cafe guide. So I wanted to convey, I wanted to convey the wonders of specialty coffee to people, but it's difficult at the beginning when you don't fully know how you just have the enthusiasm. And so a cafe guide seemed to make sense and it's quickly evolved. It just sort of every few months was evolving. As I saw, um, I want to add value. I was not wanting to kind of just waste time being one thing that won't be effective. So at first I thought be a cafe guide and maybe I can monetize on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Then as I realized monetizing on YouTube is an immense task and being a cafe guide with there being so many seems unfocused, be more useful than that. Mm -hmm. So we evolved and every six months we were something new until we found the marketplace. So we were, we did a market stall in Primrose Hill for a year and a half every Saturday. But it was a kind of farmer's market type thing, yeah? Farmer's market type of thing. Mm -hmm. But it was a very unusual thing because I always wanted to sort of be a marketeer of specialty coffee, but in a new way. I knew I wasn't going to be able to monetize just by monetizing the community, by, by, by YouTube or anything like that. And... I don't have a cafe or anything like that, but I'm a media person. So how can I monetize this? And the market store was the first experiment because what I did was was after a year or a year and a half, sorry, of being the YouTube guy, we built some reputation, maybe getting the numbers wrong in maybe two, three years, but we had enough reputation to be able to go to a coffee roaster and say, will you give us 10 bags of coffee for free if we promote you for a week? And with those 10 or 15 bags of coffee, we'll sell them on a market stall. The money we make, the profit we keep from that is the money we've earned for doing the week's promotion for you. It's more than a week because the videos are there forever. So it's just the video content and the, 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 the minimal reach we had then, but it was all right, a few thousand. But surely that wasn't enough to cover the, the cost of hiring the stall, the market stall. Well, this is it. Once you had the market stall and the costs, and even the cab fare and everything, right. I think we barely broke even. Yeah, surely. Yeah. And this is the journey we've been on for many years mm-hmm. is we've had a few concepts that are, they're not really money makers. There's a lot of work that goes into them and they seem like they're, they're going to make some money. But in the end, 
once you factor in all the effort and the costs, very little is earned, if any. But what I'm proud of is that we're always pursuing these projects with passion and with a desire to sort of be quality before profit. It's just that if you want to sustain these ideas, they have to have some profit. So yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's come... your duty, isn't it? It's your it's your moral duty for for it to be a, a success in your, your passions. You're putting in the work. You deserve the um, you deserve to be able to eat. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. You know. So we, yeah, we we did the market stall, but then we did another experiment. So six months after that, or a year after that, we did a taster set which is something like the subscription we have now. Yeah. It was much more experimental where we had a, we, we, three and we go to a different city in Europe with each edition. Oh, I like that. That's a cool touch. That's I a cool touch. It. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. We go to the city. We did a city guide. We did a cafe, um, three roasters. So we did um, interviews with the roasters. It's fantastic and rewarding and exciting and original but it was such a huge effort and cost that it was just a ridiculous amount of work and very little return. Mm. We upscaled our concept, I should say. So our concept on the market store was pay us in coffee, then we'll do some marketing. And then we did the same thing again, is that we wanted it to be through coffee sales that we will earn back for our effort. But these mm. experimental ideas, I think, were just not sustainable. So. Mm. But I was learning and priming, yes. preparing for the road ahead. And yeah, because think- this, this was pretty early doors as well, wasn't it? It was about, it was, a, it was like 2017, I think, when you did the first taster set. Is that about right? The very first one? Yeah. Something like that. So you've yeah. been doing the podcast for two years, something like that, right? Ish. Podcast? The, the, uh, the, like the, the reviews, the, get the, the YouTube kind of going in. Uh, yeah, going to different it. roasters, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um did you did you look into on that model? Did you look into because you've already covered the fact that like the cost of like wines is very expensive. And I think it was before we started the call, but um the cost of wines are very expensive. So so you could expect to have some sort of upsell or luxury sell. Did you ever look into kind of like the luxury end of that? taste a set or was it just something that didn't really interest you i didn't look into a lot of things we just threw ourselves into these concepts i i always felt that if i just keep trying to create new positive things put them out there that something will land and something will get it will be exciting and sustainable and grow so these, I don't know why we threw ourselves into that, that sort of concept because it's really expensive to commit to flying to another city somewhere and then somehow getting a profit out of this. I mean, it's, it's, it's a crazy idea, but I'm glad that we pursued these, these, these ideas because we've learned a lot through our mistakes. Oh, definitely. Definitely. So valuable. And imagine that we don't know when we're going to be able to travel again. And you've done all that learning now. Exactly. Yeah. And we made the connections as well. And it was great because there was a lot of networking. We knew that we went to these events that we had to network and stuff. So we always off the back of them made episodes in these cities. But the Paris episode very early on in 2014, I think it was episode three. But that was just a little holiday that we took to Paris. So we, we decided to then do an episode in Paris. Just pull so, the camera out kind of thing. Yeah. Exactly. It was just a part of our lives back then. And it seems like, you know, as long as the front end looks like, oh, they're a travel guide and they go international and stuff. It's like, well, really, that's just us on our holidays or business trip here or whatever. I was going there. But yeah. So it just Did you, sort did of you claim comes- back business expense? not really no oh you see there's another one there's another one we can chop that uh, <laughs> but i think it's it's time as time has gone by enough that they wouldn't be able to if you had <laughs> you know it's a it's a legal business expense no yeah i mean technically well self-employed you could everything isn't it is an expense yeah that's true uh, as my as a freelance 
filmmaker, you could literally, every meal is a business munch. And mm, yeah. Even going to the movies was work. It was research, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, it's research. Yeah. I think it's like dinners as well with people, as long as there's no alcohol or something. Oh, really? Or like you can't, you can't claim on alcohol or something. But right. the, big, the big businesses do. So I think they just claim it's something else. Because <laughs> I've heard of businesses that have taken clients on and done champagne tasting as the, sort of the entertainment. So what? they've got like a bottle of Cristal versus a <laughs> bottle of Dom Perignon. And then now that's now entertainment costs rather than alcohol costs. And so yeah, you can be quite creative with it, can't you? Yeah. yeah. So so you're you're doing these, you're you're going off and you've created this tester this uh, like tester set. And how like having a look at those that old content, how do you feel now, like that journey that you've been on? How does it feel looking back at that like that old stuff? So the taster set, was there like nerves? going into that when you launched that was there nerves or did you feel like fully confident in the idea i both i mean i've yeah. had a immense confidence in the concept um but nerves all the time mm -hmm. it's very um it's really really nerve-wracking when you have to go in front of camera and do these things and it's only in the last two years i think covid and going live until then I was one of those people that it's sometimes on a good day, I was doing it great. And on a bad day, a hundred takes and I, I just couldn't get it together. And I'd be, I'd be worried. Am I really able to do this? You talk about confidence, but I wasn't born or destined or imagined that I would be a presenter in my life or presenting my own business <laughs> yourself. Yeah. Yeah, so you say. I mean, no, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, do you believe in a destiny? I just didn't imagine this would be the hat I'd be wearing. And mm -hmm. so I, I enjoy doing it, and I don't overanalyze that I'm not the guy I imagined I'd be doing it. But sometimes when it, I'm not doing it well, that's when I catch myself saying, but you, you're not a presenter. You weren't trained. You're not former. How are you really able to do this? And then I... It, it can cause a lot of confidence to just unravel. And because I, I, I didn't imagine this as my, my destiny, I, I then try to shrug it and say, oh, well, then there's my excuse almost mm -hmm. if I'm bad. That's right. wrong. I shouldn't do that. Well, I think it's natural. You know, I think it's something that, uh, well, I would say two things about that. First thing, you hide it very well. I'll say that much. You hide it very well. If you're feeling nervous, even these days, when you go to present, you hide it very well. Because even the old stuff, I don't see you as like a nervous presenter at all. Really? But yeah, yeah, really. But the second thing is, if you're, for me personally, and I've done all sorts of presenting and performance, et cetera, but for me personally, if you're not feeling nervous going out there, if, whether it be in front of a, an audience or in front of a camera, there's, there's something a bit wrong. Something's not quite right there. Right. The, the, I, I wonder, though, if I could just find that space where I'm just like I'm talking to someone where I'm not, because you're not nervous when you're talking to people in a room sometimes, that you're enjoying the moment, the conversation, and initially nerves can be good because they keep you frosty and alert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I find that if the nerves continue for too long, I get brittle. Mm -hmm. I want it to melt away. I want the nerves to just be these kind of little spikes that, that nudge you, but yes. they're not constantly there. And, and when, I, when I let them linger, that's when I find that I'm not flexing and I'm not responding to the moment. I'm just more... Am I doing okay? I'm just having that internal dialogue. And I, I don't want to be doing that in the best situations when I'm presenting. Maybe I'm talking more about live because I have to connect with the audience and stuff. And now this taster set coffee club thing, I'm committing to doing at least two live events every month. So I want to do a live cupping section and I want to do training new people, brew classes, that kind of thing. So part teacher, presenter, this sort of thing, that I'm committing to now 
it's 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 interesting. It'll help me feel like I'm I'm in the moment more. And I think when I do presenting non-live, I'll have brought a lot of the live sensibilities to that to make me less nervous and able to kind of just not try to be such a slick professional. When I take myself too seriously, that's when I'm at my worst. Mm. I think when I'm I, because this is this is my 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 challenge is that I'm a non-professional coming into the marketing specialty coffee in a world full of you know like we talked about recipes and numbers and and it's um, it's it's an analytical thing and there are a lot of professionals who know this game a lot better than me and I'm sort of trying to rub shoulders with a lot of trained professionals and speak their language. But at the same time, I, I constantly feel like an idiot. So mm. I've got a lot of a lot of mental juggling to do when I do this presenting. Yeah, absolutely. And well, the good thing is that it doesn't it doesn't show. So the next bit is like controlling controlling those nerves, like the duck. Yeah, yeah. Pool on the surface, exactly. paddle like hell underneath. Exactly like the duck. One hundred percent like the duck. Be the duck. Um, but yeah, that's kind of. That's, that's something that I could actually help you with. Uh, I've been coaching somebody recently in um, confidence building uh, off the back of this, really. Um, wow. They wanted some help to present for a boardroom uh, program. So there was like a work presentation, help them with it. They were ecstatic. They were like, oh my gosh, even if I don't get it, um, I don't care because I know that I did the best I could possibly do because of your coaching, Jason. Thank you so wow. much. Got an update yesterday. They got it. Wow. So they got the actual thing. So I was like, mm, well done. Nice one. Mm. Nice. But um, wow. yeah, so so I could definitely help with that one. But so with regard to, yeah, nice. With, with, re with regard to presenting, so do you feel as a result like you're, over time you've become as a presenter, the more you talk about like feeling like you're inexperienced, but you're obviously incredibly experienced. Like your, your YouTube channel has grown and grown uh, year on year. You've grown your profile on your social medias. You've got this uh, very successful company that yes, you are having to give up your nine till nine till one, two in the mornings, but it's going to be so worth it. Right in the end it will and, and do you find like as time goes by you become more like you feel like you don't like the more you're into it the, the less you know or is it you do feel like you're getting to a point now where you're really kind of settling in i think it comes in waves i've stepped into rooms that felt really large and i look back and i go that wasn't a large room because now i'm in a large room and it keeps happening so i go through these waves where I feel very small and insecure and then quite strong. And I'm, I'm now, I, I, I really own that side of things. And, and yeah, fortunately we're growing and the company is moving forward and it's pushing us sometimes into a bigger room and where I go through it all, all over again. So it's sort of in cycles. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad for that because sometimes when I, I feel that insecurity, I now understand that that's the signs of, of growth. It's good. Accept that you're now stepping into a larger world, and yeah, with it, absolutely. If you're not growing, you die. Yeah, exactly. Like like in nature, if you're not growing, you die. And I'm constantly saying this throughout the episodes, but it's so true. If you ain't growing, you die. And so that's that, that's my like motivator daily. Yeah. But whenever I feel like I try not to rush stuff as well, though. If I've got like. If I've got a project on and I want to get the project finished, sometimes when I finish that project on that given day, I want to immediately start another one. But then I have to say to myself, like, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Take a little, take a little section, a little half an hour, or whatever, to just chill, do something else, because otherwise you're going to feel like you're kind of burnt, burning out. You know? Do you have well, that same? I was going to say, sorry, my, my struggle is the opposite because I have, um, it's like eight people rushing through the doors. You know, they're all trying to get in. They all get stuck. Me, 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 me. And it, it's like nothing gets done. 
I sometimes I flick through Netflix at the end of the day. I want to watch something just to unwind. I can't find anything. It takes me half an hour and then I end up just switching it off and going to bed and I feel terrible, you know. It's, it's get to, it's get Gaia. Get Gaia.com, dude. Gaia, what's that? G A I A. Get Gaia. Okay. You won't struggle to find anything on Gaia. But it's, the, it's it, just it's, represents it's, um, but it's it's all mindfulness and exploration of oh, the I soul see. and it's just fantastic. Mindfulness so many is ex- wonderful things. Mindfulness is exactly what I want to do. Now I've learned I've heard about mindfulness over the years. I've heard about the meditations and the benefits of it. Um, David Lynch swears by it, by the way. Transcendental um, meditation. Yes. That's what he's into, yeah. Oh, damn hippie. So um <laughs> Yeah, I look, I really want to do it, but it's really, really expensive to do transcendental meditation. It's incre- like with the actual people. It's you have incredibly a expensive. Yeah, I don't want to do any of that. But I'll tell you about mindfulness. I had a, an, an experience because I didn't see the benefits. I mean, I'd heard about them, but I didn't really want to get into it. But one day I was lying there next to my cat and I was just... I don't know. I was thinking about him. I was focused on him because I know him so well. And I was imagining from his perspective, how the world seems. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just decided to just not think about me in any way. I was just thinking about Woody and Woody's world right now. He's sitting there in the chair and how he sees the window and how he sees he is a car or whatever. And the more you think about how a cat thinks, because you do understand how cats think and what, how they process. And then when you get to know your cat or whatever, you, you get to understand their reactions. And I found myself getting into this mindful space. And I realized that by being him, by becoming him, I'm, become, I'm living in the moment, in the present. They don't think about the past or the future so much. They live in the moment, <laughs> the way they process things. And I just got a taste of that. And it gave me this incredible... I don't know, the spiritual mindful moment. Mm. And I think that's partly what they mean by animal spirit guides, maybe, and things like that, is that your animal, I think it was, um, I've forgotten his name, the Trues, the guy who does the, the True News. Uh, true News. Never he was married to, what's her name? He was married to Thingy Perry, and then they got divorced. Oh, um, Russell Brand. Russell Brand, he said that when his cat died, he talked about this constant, this animal in his life, this animal totem connection to nature. And it's really true. That's really what they are, is that there's this, this totem about mindfulness, about not the, that really what separates us humans in the end of the day is that we know we're going to die. So it makes us create all these insecurities and these rationalizations and negotiations with ourselves about the inevitable rather than just (laughs) having the the ability to be present in the moment and process that in itself in a pure form and and the animals can teach us to be that way so yeah definitely my um in answer to your question you asked me whether i had a a pet um and that was a gecko what a gecko yeah, I had a pet gecko. You bonded with this thing. Yeah, so lovely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I find that I don't understand how people bond with amphibians, but I mean, I guess you can. Do they yeah, exist- I mean, it, it's what was tricky though was the tricky thing about it was you couldn't actually like connect with them or her for very long because you are a radiator to them because they re- <laughs> need that radiator. Right. right. So it have like they have like a heated blanket underneath their like bedding. Because yeah. obviously they're used to desert climates, which would be hot under on the ground. So you become the the ground, as it were. But after a certain time, they do become a bit cold. So you have to go put them back in their their um vivarium, terrarium. And so I forget just- what the other ones. There's like three different depending on what animal you have. It's like one is a wet room, one is like a sauna. And one is something in between. But my mum got two little miniature dash huns. And oh my gosh, they are just divine. They're just yeah, so lovely. So lovely. But and you, 
did you experience I know exactly what you're talking about yeah yeah i mean there's moments where they just look at you and and you just you you got that bond haven't you that connection and you just know and i'm sure if i was able to spend more time with them i would i would understand 100% woody's world right now i'm sort of like woody's world 0.7 so is this mindfulness? Is this what you can get on your own? Can you get to this place where you're not thinking about past, future, yeah. or anything like that? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you'd have to spend a lot of time meditating and a lot of time working on yourself because you got some, as in you, the general, physical- the general you, exactly, the general you. There is so much going on inside of us, and a lot of that stuff isn't even our own. You know, this, you're, you're holding on to stuff now that you wouldn't even believe you've been holding on to. But um, anyway, is this your first business, Tim? I know you say you kind of had, you're in film and did you have kind of companies before? Do you have businesses before? Oh, I've just tried my hand at different things. Um, film and TV was, has always been my first love as a career for years. I mean, now I would say, it's not because I see the pitfalls, and um, but I want. To, I tried stand-up comedy. I did that for a while. Yeah, yeah. My very first gig, strange experience at the Comedy Cafe, Rivington Street. Um, the owner, a guy, a great guy, a legend called Noel Faulkner, and um, my first night. That was my first ever stand-up comedy gig. It was on Thursday night, amateur night, and the first guy that went on before me. Um, I remember the announcer said, and oh, Jim's, well, whatever is now in here. I was like, oh, this is the guy going on right before me. i got to get ready now. I'm on in 20 minutes. So I was nervously waiting at the side. He goes up on stage. He had something in his hand, I think a bowl of cream or something. I vaguely remember this years ago, but he held the cream in his hand, looked at the audience and went, F it, and walked off. Just couldn't handle it. I was like, what? Uh, oh. And everyone's like, what? And then the mic guy goes, oh, and okay, Tim Rogg. Oh, I wasn't ready. I was like, what? This guy, fr- and I've never seen anyone do that before. Oh, they really? have a right before mine. And that really threw me. And I went up on stage and uh, I was ready to do my stand up. I was in a warm audience who were ready to be entertained. But the moment I was about to talk, that first second, it was the longest second of my life. I swear to you, that one second felt like half an hour. And in that half an hour, I was processing everything that other guy went through. And I realized what he went through in that one (laughs) second, half an hour. Oh, yeah. I'm going through it now. And he was like, we're both thinking, I'm not a hostage, okay? I'm not tied to the floor with a bag on my head or the gun just off camera saying, read these lines. I'm a free man. I can leave. I can do whatever I like. I don't have to do this scary, awful thing of trying to make uh-huh. strangers laugh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he, he just bottled and gave in. And you, you have to kind of push through that and keep going because that's the hardest first second. Yeah. Where you just want to go, nope, nope. And I've never seen anyone do it, but he had to do it right before me. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But, yeah. My stand-up career was a lot of that kind of nervy, not quite connecting, wanting to sort of make people laugh. I think people found me entertaining, but I wasn't, I wasn't enjoying the process. And I thought there's a long road ahead here of, yeah, and I don't know if I want to monetize this career. So mm. he and me just unravels it and kind of, I kept shifting and changing, mm-hmm. sailing, looking for the wind, tacking. And, but meanwhile, um, you still had a career, didn't you? You had like a, you were going. Yeah, I would always work as a freelancer in TV. Mm-hmm. And because of this fragmented business where I just, I, I tried to become a commercials director where you don't have, you only need to work three times a year and that pays for everything. But to get to be a commercials director, you have to have a reel. So I spent money making a short film on film. It cost thousands of pounds and put me in debt for eight years. But Oof. yeah. So it was those sort of expensive ventures just to get on the scene of being a director and the pushback and the, 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 the difficulties of getting signed onto people's, onto agencies and books that I thought, okay, I'll work in television 
in the meantime as a TV jobbing director. And even that was a challenge because now in TV, you're not just required to be a director at the lower ends, at the lower echelons of sort of reality TV and all these different programs. You're often required to be the camera director, editor, edit producer, whatever, all these different hats. And it wasn't quite suiting my my inability to sort of latch on to a simple career. So um, it was very oil and vinegar, but I was persistent and I had no other training or no other interest. I'm a very interest. That's the thing with ADHD is it's interest based. When you find something you love, you, you can focus on that. It's a superpower. You can be really great at it. It's, it's both a help and a hindrance. That's, that's, I haven't spoken enough about the positives of ADHD is that you can be hyper-focused on the good things. And I think that's why coffee was great and the timing of it, because it's allowed me to finally engage that, that ability to just keep going on one thing. And because I'm working for myself now, that's why I'm willing to do these projects like the taster sets and the, the market stalls and the years of videos and the, the time I've put in where I don't care if I'm not monetizing this or that. I'm planning for the future. I really believe that one day I would be here doing mm. what I'm doing now. On the podcast. Yeah, I know. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Destiny. You know? <laughs> Destiny. 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 I have the power. <laughs> right. You were just quoting Masters of the Universe, Skeletor, right? The, the, the vital scene. The, the, the movie? Yeah. The show. The movie. The cartoon. The movie. No, the movie. With Dolph, Dolph Lundgren. Lundgren. Yeah. Awful, awful movie. What? <laughs> no! Love that film. Yeah, it's great. It was great. Dolph Lundgren is he, man? Come on. You it's couldn't so even good. have an American accent. I have the power. I have the power. <laughs> what have been your biggest, like, have there been any challenges along the way? The, at the time, you were like, oh, my God. But now you're like, you know what? I'm really pleased that that happened. Quite a few, yeah. I mean, a lot of these things that I said, these uh, projects that we pursued, and then when they don't work, I'm, I'm not heartbroken because I feel like a salvaging from it. They're Christ-attunities, I call it. That's a made-up word of mine. I love Christ-attunities. Christ-attunities. Christ-opportunities. Yeah. Every crisis for us, I feel, is an opportunity because... If you know what you can salvage from that, and often when you move forward, you'll be in a place where had it not been for that crisis, you wouldn't be here. So there's too many of those things happening in my life where because that didn't happen, I'm now in a better place. Because that thing broke, I then repaired or did something better. So that's, that's kind of the attitude I've learned to gain as well, is that when I make a mistake on something, or when it can be a simple, it's a, it's a philosophy that runs through everything. So if I'm doing a post and it takes me half an hour to do a post on, on Instagram because it requires stickers and stories and I've got to market this product and, and then it gets deleted and I've got to do all that work again. It's very oh. frustrating. Oh gosh, very, yeah, very those times. You're that like, it's really? Just, yeah, and you're just like, I can't do that again. It was the moment's gone, but you just have to pull yourself together and say, right, exactly. do it. And, but do it better. Now is the crisis opportunity. You, yeah. you couldn't have before. You would have posted it that good way. So if you do it better, you'll actually feel good about the opportunity that was created. So I try to let that philosophy kind of dictate, kick in at least when, when the, the crisis comes. Have you, uh, do you like sci-fi? Love sci-fi. Have you ever read the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov? No, nah, I don't read much. Oh, you've got to read those. They're not very, they're not very, uh, not very long. When you do get an opportunity to read, they're all about crises. Really? So, so they're, it's, um, they're, 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 what's the word for it? They are they're almost like keystoned, I guess. They're keystoned by these crises that happen throughout the lifetime of this particular group of people that have to rebuild an empire on the other end of the galaxy with, or the universe with nothing. Um, 
the concept is this 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 empire has grown so big it needs a whole planet to run its administration so mm-hmm. the whole planet is one big city and it's just admin offices and that's what you need to run this galaxy just purely audits crazy right so Sounds this like guy yeah, yeah so this exactly yeah so this guy harry selden says he develops this thing called psychohistory and he predicts that the empire will crumble in a thousand years and he says give me a hundred scientists and and i will go to this particular planet um in the galaxy or and i will um and i will just live there with these hundred and they're laughing at him because it's a barren planet and the empire collapses in 500 years, not 1000 years. This is all covered in the first 10 pages of the book, by the way, no oh spoilers. God. And then, um, yeah. And then they have to rebuild, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great book. It's a great book for that. Like, and it Christ, sounds, this is, from what you're describing, um, sounds like why this is why they're not films. They sound unfilmable, really epic. And well, you say that Apple TV are making a TV series after all these years. Well, this is good because the miniseries, the rise of the miniseries is allowing a lot of stuff that was unfilmable because they couldn't fit it into two hours Yeah, to be filmable now, which yeah. is great. And the budget looks massive. Wow. It looks it looks bonkersly huge. You should check out what the trailer should... after the chat. Okay. But I think it's what they should do with Dune is make it yeah. a miniseries. It's it's wrong yeah. to kind of just make it a one, one more movie. I mean, you, it's kind of strange though. They've made, they have made a miniseries of Dune. A few yeah, times, nineties thing. What a disaster! They made they made one with David Lynch, Best one film, film. Okay. and then they made another show, didn't they, on Sky? And now they're making it again. But the new um, movie is just a remake. That's the, I'm disappointed in this. It, near, did it come uh, out? No, I saw the trailer though, and it, it does. Mm. It looks like they're just covering everything Lynch covered, maybe mm. a bit more. But if anything, they should cover stuff he didn't cover. Yes. He, 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 he did a great movie. You don't remake a classic that was done well. I know, done make so well. Godfather again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, strange, strange. Very defensive over classics that get remade mm-hmm. badly. It's like, unless you've got an absolutely amazing take on this, don't take a great film and remake it. I mean, it's like, leave it alone. Yeah, just take the idea, I guess, and, exactly. and riff, riff with it somewhere. Yeah. Or do yeah. like a prequel or something. I don't know. The prelude. Yeah. Um, or even modernize it. Like do the same yeah. story but with a different setting. Or yeah, like... a different setting or something. Yeah. But um, so we've kind of touched on on those Christ-attunities. How do yeah. you like rebuild after a Christ-attunity? Because how do you identify in yourself like, oh, no, that was poor execution on our part versus, oh, this is a Christ-attunity. <laughs> Well, the, the, the crisis opportunities present themselves as opportunities if you, if you know how to extract the opportunity out of it. I don't, unless we talk about a real, situ- real situation, I'm not sure how to analyze it. But mm-hmm. um, if, it's, if it's a setback that isn't an opportunity, then I try to forget those. You know, like... Um, like in a, in a relationship, you, you, you can have a lot of fights, but you just don't hold on to the memories of those for the sake of a good relationship. So I don't want to hold on to all my setbacks and failures and misdoings and mistakes because that, that, that will just lead to all sorts of doubt and insecurities. Yes, absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. But what about opportunities where, or moments where you've, you've actually kind of gone, oh yes. You know, like, have you had any kind of defining moments where you've gone, oh, my God, I'm so happy that happened, that you'd be willing to, or that you're able to impart without giving any trade secrets away, of course? Well, I told you the big one, right, which is the discovery that we're on to this new drink. This is a new thing. Oh, yeah, that right. Be the, the quintessential thing, because ever since then, it's just about, I, I'm just like a dog chasing a car, and then they grab hold of that that back. And then don't let go. And that's me. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just that dog. It was right. smart enough to recognize the taxi early and I've caught yes. hold of it and I'm not letting go. Yes. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to take it, haven't you? Yeah. You've got to see those bang and, and take it. Mm. 
I yeah, knew all along that if I let go, then all these years invested being ahead of the curve is going it, it, to, I've, I've wasted the opportunity that was presented to me back then mm-hmm. to build on something. Because now we're coming into, into a, a busy market, a competitive market. And as we launch our subscription service and everything, it's like we have to now muscle in with other people who, who are not only competing, some have been in this space already and some have a lot more invested behind them, but not none, if any, very few, I should say, have any kind of community to support that. Mm-hmm. And to me, it seems like, like a hollow a hollow product without the community and the excitement and the mm-hmm. adventure, which is what we're trying to bring to this. And, and the, the sort of the sense that we're not going to talk down to people who are new and not be boring to people who really love all the details. Yeah. It's a hard thing to juggle. So by being those things, I think, yeah, we we the, the t- it was great to have the timing and stick with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So you're launching your, you, I see on your website, you've got the relaunch of the, um, the subscription service, but it's yeah. out now, isn't it? You this can... was our first three editions where we tested it every two months. We, we, we wanted to see the logistics because we, we realized when we did our taster set in 2017, that it was all heart and no head when we decided what we wanted to do. A different city in Europe. It's so exciting. We can interview the roasters. It's so exciting. We can do this and that. Oh, and then the lessons learned were, was the most important lesson learned, I should say, is that we have to really plan what's scalable. Can we really do this on a monthly basis and sustain it? Mm. We start from the point of what's the most we can do and then start to pare it back which I'm, that's what I'm very proud of here is that we're trying to see how much we can stuff into the experience and then just remove what's just not sustainable rather than, well, where's the profits and how much, how little should we do to make sure that we can just have this machine keep turning? Yes. And I don't want it to be that. I want it to feel always bespoke and fresh and exciting. So, and that can be sustainable. And, uh, we figured it out over these three editions every two months. We're going to learn a lot when we go monthly because that's a different logistical challenge. But um, yeah. So it launches. Oh, sorry. April. It launches April and it will be a monthly service. We're changing from the five samples we've had um, and the five whole bags because it's both a whole bag and sample taster set subscription. Mm-hmm. So um, we're going to switch to four for the monthly. Five a month is just too much for us to deal with. Three a month is just not, a, not enough of an adventure. So you can have one a week. It's, it's, we could do one a week. A lot no, of- I mean, like, you know, if you, if you got the taster, taster set, they could yeah. at least, they have that chronology, don't they? People, bang, I'll, I do this, I'll do number one this week. I'll do number two next week. Exactly. I, I thought, yeah, when it's like that, you can literally have a coffee of the week as well. We could do, we could yeah. focus on each roaster. They can have a whole week. There's a lot we can do with that. Yeah. Because there's, five like is, said, five, um, somebody's going to feel left out. <laughs> yeah. You know, or you could, I guess I you could always do, five. yeah. I guess you could always do tough. Monday, Monday to Friday. One. Five was great. Five was like so many good things about five. Our logo had five. There's five continents, the five flavor groups in, in specialty coffee. So five. it's a great number as well. A lovely number. And I really, it was tough to go to four just on that mathematical level alone. But mm-hmm. yeah, four is the sustainable, but yet still exciting subscription yeah. that we've always wanted. Yeah. My, one, of my, one of my favorite numbers is four. So I'm happy. Mine's 12. I love 12. Well, that's three fours. So we're good. 12, that's what's so good about it. It can be two halves of six, three of this, four, four of three, two. It breaks into all these different pieces. Yeah. Interesting. Great Never number. thought about that. Well, my other favorite number is eight. Four plus eight is 12. Why do you like eight? Yeah, I just like it. If you, chuck, if you tip it over, it's infinity. Um, it's two, it's two whole, you know, it's two whole circles, bind yeah. them together, better together, bang into a circle. That's how you make a complete partnership. 
Beautiful. It's, a, it's just a lovely number. Now I also, love it. And also, it's like a, a racetrack. You just keep on going round. It's, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> Hourglass as well. Like a yeah. Yeah. yeah I, think you, I think in typography, eight, there's some beautiful eights out there in the typography wow. world. Nice. You can do a lot with the with the number eight. It seems you can have a lot of fun with the number eight. Yeah, I don't know. Right. I actually like it. Um, so, yeah, when I'm when I look at your p- presenting, we've kind of covered presenting a little bit, but when I when I look at your presenting, I yeah. feel personally that there's a lot of performance within it. There is. It is very performative. Do you like study it? Do you, is it just from, do you have like a favorite presenter or do you just, you, is there a hidden actor within you having worked in film TV? Like where does that kind of, what's your inspiration? It honestly comes from um, the fact that I'm not a trained presenter, but I was, I tried, I studied acting at school. I did my GCSEs in acting. I did theater studies at um, a level high school, a levels. Yep. And uh, I did the stand-up comedy. I enjoy performing. I didn't do a lot of it, but I wasn't a stranger to it when it was time to sort of go in front of camera and do right row stuff. Um, And the performing side, the more sort of comedy performing side, I've had to suppress more and more over the years as I find this more comedic, sensible approach. But I've just wanted to be always doing fun, entertaining comedy performances where possible. Just, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I, sometimes I feel like I'm trying to be certain people, but I'm not aware of it consciously. I'm just such a movie buff and in love with so many comedy actors like Jim Carrey and a thousand others in my mind when I'm doing performances. Well, you, you, Jason, remind me of sort of, you're sort Thank of a you. combination of Jim Carrey and, um, forgotten his name, that other actor. Who? Um, I saw him the other day. Uh, he's an art house film actor. Um, okay. Oh, Ico, what's his name again? Vincent Gallo. That's it. Vince Vincent Gallo. Gallo. <laughs> Vincent Gallo. Let's have a look here. Vincent Gallo. Vincent Gallo meets Jim Carrey. Oh yeah, you know what? When as soon as you said Vincent Gallo, this guy's bra- this guy's picture popped up in my head, and I was <laughs> like, I've never heard of Vincent Gallo before in my life. But yeah, you're right. like Jim Carrey. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, this guy. Oh, that's cool. That's some lovely compliments. Well, uh, the um, the first so, the yeah. first guy the first guy that actually is a catalyst for my inspiration was Jim Carrey. Really. Yeah, wow. watching him in The Mask in the 90s. We watched him the other day in um, The Cable Guy, which is such yes. a powerful film. Oh, good in that. Under, underestimated really in that one, isn't he? But look at him when he's in that big satellite dish at the end, and he's eulogizing about the future because it's made in the 90s. And he's saying, soon we're going to be able to play video games with the man in Taiwan and do shopping on our phone. And he's predicting it's all going to come. It's a warning because he's a psychopath. And it's like... <laughs> it's. it's it's excellent. It was such a well, fortune. They, yeah, they got to tell you though. That's the that's the that's the thing, isn't it? They have to tell you what they're up to before they do it to us. That's true. To see yeah. whether we're all right with it. <laughs> you know, they have to tell us first. <laughs> One us of the yeah. So by the way, we're gonna. This is your future. If you guys are all happy with it, we'll go ahead. If you all start protesting after this film, then fair enough. We'll hold you back for a couple more years. So they sell it as like, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. Sell it as well. They always sell the dream, the exciting part. Yeah. But we don't know what, what all the uh, the downside is, you know, like social media. <laughs> he was selling social media in the 90s and saying it's going to connect people and it's going to make them do this and that. You're only you're not going to talk about that. It, it, it's going to put some people in hospital and give rise to hate groups and this and that and trolls. It's a term you'd say trolls, really. You mean the little creatures in the caves. Mm. You wouldn't even know what you mean a troll is. The mm. idea that somebody controls someone. You know, it's like we have new new ways to be nasty and insidious and be messed up. There's a massive generation of uh, 
messed up people to come, I think. The kids that don't know a world without social media are going to need therapy in their 40s as they kind of ask the big questions of who they are. And they've spent their life branding themselves through social media, not even in the adult years. It starts young for a lot of people. I worry about that generation. Become a psychoanalyst, if you want to make Yeah, but I mean, isn't isn't part of that, sometimes I think, like, isn't part of it just the same kids that would have got behind kind of Britney back in the day? But this is different because now when you have in your hand the phone. Yeah, like no escape. Mm. And it's like you can broadcast to the world yourself and then who you are, you're no longer thinking of yourself from the first person. You're thinking of yourself in the third person half the day. You're thinking about the brand that's you and how others see you and how am I going to represent myself to that new global audience potentially. And so you're always branding yourself all day. And it's, mm-hmm. it's for people who've, it's all right if you do that from the age of 16, 15, 18 onwards, when you've already had time for your personality to harden without that, that third person perspective. But if you're doing it from, from the age of three or six or eight, then it's really a, there's, there's, a, there's a tsunami of, of, of psychoanalysis to come. Yeah, but that's why you've got you to work on yourself every day, you know, yeah. even if it's a little bit. You know, a thing, thing I've been doing recently is, um, you know, two things that I'm excited about today, two things that I can do for my body today, and two things that I can do for my mind today. Oh, wow. As like, a pra- as like a practice of, of gratitude for the day, you know? Is this namaste? Is this kind of spiritual Eastern stuff or is this This modern? is, uh, this is um, I guess, that, so it developed from, I was listening to some Tony Robbins mm. and he was saying, um, he was saying like, choose two, two, like choose a number of questions. Choose three questions that you can ask yourself every day. Three questions. And those were my three questions that I came up with. And when you do this, when you go through this, what does it do for you for the rest of the day? It makes you want to get out of bed. Right. It puts a carrot for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Right. Cause, cause like, you know, like with your, when you're content creating, gosh, it doesn't half feel like a treadmill. <laughs> yeah. So you yeah. need some sort of compelling future, don't you? You need yeah. something to compel you to move you forward. And do you feel that you have a big picture in mind for your for your your plans when you do things, or do you yeah. go more on instinct? Yeah, no, hundred percent. So, like one of my one of my big goals um, is to have a load of. Um, I want to I want to fund ten community theaters. And I want to fund 10 scholarships. That's like my goal. That's amazing. So that's something I'm working towards. And, you know, I go off the GC or the Grant Cardone thing of like success is your duty. You know, we live in a world where the God or universe, whatever you want to call it, you know, it it doesn't want you to be poor. It doesn't want you to be hungry. If it's experiencing itself, it wants to experience itself in the best possible way. And for all of those folks that don't enjoy money or don't think that money is the root of evil, you can't do the things that you want to do and make the changes that you want to make on the planet Earth without it in its current form, like the planet that we live on. You need it, don't you? The capitalist system. Well, I guess even if you went to how many, how many countries are there left that don't that have uh, that have a bartering system still where it's just no, you no trade way. your skill i just think that the for profit model is going to be under serious scrutiny over the next decade because it's sort of proving to be unsustainable ecologically resources wise these are the hot topics now and i I'm, I'm working in ind- in an industry that's kind of at the forefront of this it's feeling um it's feeling the changes, the, the, the sort of the, the, the climate change is affecting all the coffee crops and the specialty coffee is very sensitive to slight changes. Mm. Regular coffee. I mean, there's two types of coffee beans, the Robusta and the Arabica. And the Robusta yeah, right. mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's the cheap, nasty bean that, that sort of gives you a real caffeine rush and then also gives you headaches and it can also drop and give you fatigue. So it's a real up, down. And uh, they're, they're robust beans. They look, they, they're climate friendly. They're fine. But the business I'm in is seeing the changes and feeling the impact. And I'm, I'm hearing all the stories from around the world and uh, resources. It's, it's, I'm keenly aware of, of, of uh, a future where this kind of voracious for-profit societal uh, attitude is going to shift. More and more people, I think, are just going to step back and question the fabric of, of capitalism itself, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, like, you're going to have, you're certainly going to have, a, the thing is, you may see, we have a very throwaway culture, and that, as a result, we create too much waste. So yeah. there can be, in the future, there can be, we can live realistically in a future where there aren't things like products. Instead, we all have 3D printers and you just have your 3D printer and there's none of this like go to the store to buy the product. So there's less waste because we just print it. Yeah. Right? And you can have a world where there is um, was it zero, zero point energy or what have you, free energy. So now you have even less waste and vertical the, farms, these yeah. new vertical farmings exactly. and making hydroponics, meat, all that kind of jazz. And making meat in jars and labs. And uh, what I think is. Oh, we don't the, want that, though. No, <laughs> no, don't, don't live in that world. I don't know. I'm just thinking maybe that less animals have to die. But Oh, yeah, that's but, true. Well, yeah, yeah, I guess. No, actually, yeah, to be fair, to your point, you could live, we could live in a world where we have replicators. And the replicator creates organic material that you can eat. And then it is infused with minerals and vitamins and enrichment. But then would we evolve to the point where we don't, we just have one clean pipe from our mouth to our anus. Oh, no, do you know what I mean? There's no, there's no organs to actually digest anything. That doesn't sound fun at all. <laughs> no, it doesn't, does it? So it's sometimes you think, what if they already have all of this stuff? Like, I'm of the feeling that they probably have an iPhone 20 and they've probably had the iPhone 20 for at least five years, but you don't fund the projects and you don't fund the actual, the, the future of technology and advancement without getting Chinese. to buy it. The Chinese can save us. They are in a position to save us because they, they're, they're going to switch on a machine that can, can, can make rain, can make weather and mm. the size of India, the area the size of India. That goes, gets switched on in 2025. Also, fusion. They're, going, they're working on fusion because they don't have the red tape. You know, they don't have, they can just green light projects and go for it. So, of course, their, their, their empire is rising and they're going to start, they're, they're already taking resources from all around the world and doing what empires do. But I think also they're, they're, they're a different kind of empire to the American empire we live under and the British one and all these other empires whose they're ones that, that live at the edge of this sort of um, need for energy revolution and things to, that sustainable energy. If we don't find, make fusion work or find something that's renewable and, and sustainable, they could be in a position to do that, I think. I mean, you know, I'm kind of of the feeling that they already know how to do it. Yeah, this fusion reactor, this, this is a game changer. It's, 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 it was science fiction for years and now finally... The power of a sun harnessed. Harnessed. I have the power. There we go. It's always back to him. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. So um, you're incredibly brave back in 2015, setting off on this journey of telling the world that you loved coffee and you've kind of taken on board this responsibility of championing you know championing the the cause for coffee what can i've heard you say before about um like getting people into coffee you've mentioned it actually on this call as well trying to get me more into coffee like the good stuff kind of thing you know the real stuff Mm. so what could somebody that's listening to this and they're like but i hate coffee tim i hate it where do they start to get into this specialty coffee. Yeah. By, I mean, presumably I said, on the right roast, right? But yeah. When I say light roast is the right roast, mm-hmm. is because 
your taste buds need a bit of exercise. Taste buds are not just saying, I like this, I don't like that. They have a personality. And just like when you get a new pet or you meet someone new, you're not going to be instantly friends and you're not going to instantly bond. It takes time. Your taste buds take a little bit of time to appreciate something new. And when it does, you don't want to go back because you've, you've palate trained yourself to appreciate more detail, more delicacy. This is why they, they, people spend hundreds of pounds on sensory classes because they want to be taught formally in an, in an expensive class what it means to, for your taste buds to appreciate flavors. So I'm trying to give people that sort of journey without them knowing it almost, because they're not going to willingly go to these sensory classes that will take them through that. Some people want that, but my job is to kind of enlist people who otherwise might not. I remember I was once at a coffee festival and this guy was walking around. He had this thermos tub and specialty coffee in it. And he was walking around. He was just offering people the coffee. He was just saying he wasn't a, uh, he wasn't on a stall. He wasn't a, um, there with any business. It was just a, a fan, a coffee lover. And he just wanted to give people specialty coffee. You could tell there was people there who weren't into it. And he just wanted Wait, to get into it. That people weren't into it in a coffee festival? Well, there's another wing of the festival that's Starbucks and, and, and Nescafe. Is there? And, yeah, there's a whole wing and there's thousands of people who go there. They, right. they don't know about specialty coffee. Specialty coffee for years was just this one section. I mean, the London Coffee Festival I went to every year from 2013, it was in one room in 2013. And then it's in two rooms in 2014. And then it's in three rooms. And every year it's grown. And now it's like half, more than half the festival. 70% specialty coffee. Wow. 60%. And then... Yeah, there's all the. That's the third big, wave, big, baby, right there. Right there, the third wave, and it's it's growing, and this appreciation and stuff that people have. Some people they just they just don't get it or whatever. And this guy, he was doing a weird thing because you don't just walk up to strangers and say, "Hey, try my <laughs> coffee." But I get yeah. what he was doing. That's the passion you have when you love something, and you realize you're gonna love it too. You yes. just have to give it a bit of time. I don't know, like Guinness or whatever. When people say, you'll love it, it just takes a bit of time. Mm. So it's getting people over that barrier and then, you know, entering this, this wonderful world of flavors and adventure. A di like I said, you switch into a dynamic relationship. That's an insecurity. Imagine like the treadmill where you get on the treadmill and it's like, oh, I have to keep going. And you sort of, you don't want to keep doing that. You just want to stay still. It's when you actually realize you have to commit to this constant motion. And I feel like that's a good metaphor for getting into specialty coffee is that you're no longer going to sit back and have a drink, taste the same way every day. You're now going to love a cup of coffee, but then it's gone in a month. So you have to let it go. It's fleeting. Mm. And the next one you might hate or this one you might hate and there'll be a few duds or you brewed it wrong or that, that the way that coffee is processed, it tastes weird, but you're constantly learning so you switch to a dynamic relationship and that that's that's interesting i think in itself yeah it sounds like it sounds like through coffee you can learn to actually appreciate things in life as well and you like said through... mindfulness mm -hmm. so i just want to touch on that because when you get when i get up in the morning and i do my brewing and the grinding and the numbers and everything that really brings me a sense of alignment to my thoughts it, that's a great way to start the day like yeah, it's a ritual. Mm. It's a ritual. And then the rewards of the, you smell and then you, you drink. It's such a delicate, wonderful experience. So it's like the ritual leads to a great reward of excellence. And, and you're not sure how, quite how it's going to turn out as well. So the adventure, the, the mindfulness, the focus, and caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do think people are very quick to just like, look, I need to do this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And uh, yeah, I think it's cool. Like all of the, yeah, the spoon and, and all that, it's you know, great. and the filters and the, this, and then you get that and then you weigh it out and you scale. And, and, and you want a bit more each time. So you say, yes. I don't need scales and you don't, I had a paper cup with a marker in it for the first year. I was just putting enough beans to fill the pencil line. And then I was, I wasn't even using a, gr I was using a grinder, but I was using a very poor one. And, uh, 
you just upgrade a little bit each time and you say, right, now I, I want my coffee to taste a bit better. So mm -hmm. I'll switch out the grinder. Now I want to start using this brewer and that brewer. And you just find yourself one day, oh, I've come all this way and I didn't realize it. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's it, there's an element of, um, you made a reference to when you were um, chatting about the Java uh, grinder. Um, obviously, you, you got your trusty commandante there, but you, mm -hmm. you likened the Java grinder to a piece of camera equipment. And it's very similar to that with camera people, isn't it? They get like that with their camera equipment. It sounds the same thing happens with coffee lovers. It's something, a real thing to get behind. I think there's a part of the brain. I mean, our audience is predominantly male, but I think, and men especially have this part of the brain that wants to latch on to something like this, wants to geek out on something. Yeah, yeah. And uh Specialty coffee allows that. Regular coffee doesn't really allow that. The rewards aren't that great, and there's no process that's – you might grind the beans, but that's it. So having all this as – yeah, it, it, it's like the camera equipment. You're right. It's really just latched onto that part of the brain that we, we want to geek out and – yeah. Take Again, my money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like the fry, the fry uh, meme. You know, shut up and take my shut money. Yeah. We literally had someone tell us that in an email when we announced the taste of set launch. All right, shut up and take my money. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Great. Yeah, really cool. <laughs> so um, we're going to come to a close. First of all, how can how can people um, find you, Tim? What's the where's, what's all the lowdown? Obviously, everything will be in the link below, everybody. But for those that are, you know. Well, the right roast uh you can find us on Instagram as the right roast on um, Facebook as the right roast. Instagram's our main presence and YouTube. We have fantastic videos on YouTube. We've been doing for years. So definitely check out those. And we do live events through YouTube as well. So the right roast on YouTube, Instagram, and our website, the right roast.com. That's our marketplace. And you'll find everything you need there as well. That's our kind of centralized ecosystem. Awesome. Awesome. So a quick fire round of confident or not confident. That's all you're allowed to say. Confident or not confident. Are Got you ready it. for it? Ready. Tightrope. <laughs> yeah. Tightrope walking. Not confident. Wild camping in the jungle. Not confident. Skydiving. I'd say confident now, but I'm sure once the plane door opens, I'll change that to not confident because I want yeah. to do it, but I'm, I'm I don't know. Mm -hmm. Every time I see a video of somebody do it, I change like, my mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Start low, start low. Just jump off a small bridge <laughs> with a parachute, obviously. Um, uh, best man speech. Not confident. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Um, it depends. Again, this it depends if I'm best man to who and what crowd. I'm uh -huh. very. <laughs> yes, somebody crowd. that you don't know and a very hostile crowd. <laughs> if I got a whole bunch of foreigners and people just staring at me like <laughs> on my first gig, and like, come on, this <laughs> with a hand, <laughs> handful of cream. <laughs> uh, Anyone here? <laughs> <from Cleveland? laughs> <laughs> yeah uh parenthood not confident no confident 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 parent yeah i mean uh, more confident than not confident but i wouldn't say wholly confident mm -hmm. so 51 percent confident something you're interested in no being a parent not so much not, not right now no i think the dna uh, the most basic primal urge we have is to procreate. That's why we're here. So the DNA is going to spend your life telling you what you need to do, its purpose. Mm -hmm. But we also have a brain and we can step out and we can see things and rationalize. And I can clearly see that a human being is a huge responsibility, a life changer, and uh, a tremendous amount of uh, littering and stuff. You know, there's enough people in the world. So I've become, I've passed through the urge, reached a point where I don't really want to add any more people to the world. And uh, for now, I will remain childless, but 
one day I don't know. I might be one of those people that has a, becomes a parent when I'm 55 or mm-hmm. something. Adoption? Unlike, adopt. I want to adopt pets. I just want to save lots of animals. I want to have lots yes. of uh, shelters and dogs. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, so I found an early interview with you actually, and it spoke about oh. that. It was like, what, what, one wish would you love to, if you, if you could have one wish, you know, and money was no object or whatever, and your answer was, uh, dog, dog shelters, dog and cat shelters. Yeah, I just, I want to you know, say housing the- animals. I think, yeah, it's like yeah. an animal shelter. I think it was. Stand corrected. I'm just one of those guys. If I see a pet, I mean a, a dog, it needed help. I just want to take it home and and have it in my life. So yeah, yeah, that that would be a good thing to just be able to go get a bigger, bigger place or have the resources to allow that to happen. And like your charity things, I want to do good things like that and set up things like that because yeah, they yeah. deserve it. We created them. We spent thousands of years making them our uh, our you know domesticated extensions. them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we, we, we've, you know, they say that our faces evolve differently. Without dogs, we'd have bigger noses and different face shapes because we've transferred a lot of our duties of seeking and defending and, 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 and hunting and, and doing all sorts of things. We've delegated that to the dogs and they've, they've been like, they, they were our iPhone before the iPhone. We did <laughs> things for us. That and, is uh, bonkers. We owe them. Yeah, we do owe them big time, big time. But, Equally, we've gone off track. Final sorry, one. Eddie. That's all right. Final one is um, doing it all again. What's so you go right back one? in, go back in time. Do it all again. How far? How back? do you feel? Right to the beginning, dude. Of my life. Absolutely. I've about it so often, it's a dream and a nightmare, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's both wonderful because you get to kind of do all the, appreciate things and also do things differently. Oh, dodge that bullet, dodge that bullet. But then maybe start to realize, oh, I know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's going to happen. And uh, people are reacting and you feel isolated and alone. You'll become increasingly lonely as the world events that people react to. You're like, yeah, yeah, I know. So I don't know. I I mean, I think, (laughs) no, I think it's best to just stay linear and not do it again. If it's, (laughs) If that's what happens. Uh-huh. So you're not confident? It's the ultimate rerun, isn't it? Isn't it the most? I'm not confident. I'm not confident. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. I think, um, I think if you were aware of it, imagine if you were aware of it, right? You went back in time, you're aware of it, and you couldn't actually change any of the choices. Imagine yeah. that. Imagine that's knowing awesome. everything that's going to happen, but you are literally in a machine. Yeah, that's hell. That's like just being in a fish tank all your life. That'd be crazy, wouldn't it? Like, oh. imagine thinking, imagine thinking, I imagine like this sentence, right? So we'll go back in time. Mm. You know that you're going to say, imagine this sentence, right? So we'll go back in time. Right. But then you think to yourself, I'm not going to say that. Uh, I know that that's what I'm going to say. But then as you're thinking it, your brain goes, I'm not going to say that. And then back in time. But uh, that's every sentence. Uh, paradox. Don't. <laughs> and what if that's the only reason why we, we don't remember existence before this or after this? Because actually it is just a rerun. What life is an entire rerun? Yeah. Why do I think I've thought about this. Here's what if it's mind. just a rerun every time? You've actually just, that, that's it. That's all you've got. You die and then you just reset. I think it does because if you think about the Big Bang, everybody says that the Big Bang was the first atoms exploding out. Well, they're very simple things back then. So if universes start that way, every universe has to inevitably lead to you being created because it, mm. they ultimately at the beginning start the same way. So there's no room for random because they all start the same way. Every universe that's created, mm. I assume. Yeah, I saw, I saw there was something about um, that a flip of the coin is not actually random. It's determinism because you can, you can actually, if you knew all of the elevation and the wind speed and everything and the flip angle, you could predict 100% the outcome every time. So it's not actually yeah. as random as 50-50. Wow. And presumably the universe 
knows is the same way. Exactly. That's very true. We're just not sophisticated enough to see every little um, whatever yeah. influence. Yeah. On the flip side, on the flip side, though, so there's yeah. that, but then there's also this kind of idea that what if we are, we are in our plane of existence and just like a t there's a 2D world and there's a 3D world and there's a 4D world and a 5D world and they're all happening at the same time. It's you know, possible. Right. They've predicted 13 dimensions or something. It's kind yeah. of crazy. But this but is the you, only one with time. You can't write these things off. So Einstein was a genius, and he found fundamental laws that are just incredible. But when he was presented with chaos theory, he just said, that's, that's sorry, he said that's rubbish. And he just rejected it. He couldn't ever reconcile with the idea. He just found it too ridiculous that when things get really small, they start to go into dimensional weirdness. He's just like, that. that's two plus two equals apple. That mm. doesn't mean anything. And so he rejected it and he was a genius. And so we have to, we can't just say 13 dimensions. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. it, anything is goddamn possible. Something that always baffles my, baffles my mind is um, the, the systems, the systems and everything. So like there's us, but then there's a universe inside us and then there's a universe inside that but there's a universe outside of us, but there's like, there's a digestive system, a nervous system, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But yeah. then above it, you have weather systems, air systems, water systems, water cycles. Mm -hmm. But then you go, but like the whole thing of like, there's a, our fingerprints are all swirly. Yeah. But so like is a when, whirlpool. Yeah, and when, so, you the, when you have a bath and you look at all those swirly patterns in the soap, you think that just looks the same as like galaxies moving. They move the same way when they collide. So yeah. are we just soap bubbles in space, damn it? Yeah, that's the thing, though, because if you like look close enough, like if, you know, you look close enough at the ground, say, like mm. a, a terrain of, it's almost like what if the, the cells living on top of our scalps? You know, I like to see it as like trees are Earth's hairs. <laughs> You know, and what if that's the case here? It, like there's little things, the little bacteria that lives microscopically on our head. It doesn't know that it's living on a human. We're a planet. Talk about ego. Right. I'm a planet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an entire ecosystem. <laughs> but like literally. Yeah, we are. No, but you're right. There's the macro and the micro and everything's relative to the molecule. I am a planet and we are the molecules to this planet. Mm. I mean, I'm an earthist first. If people ask what's your religion, I'm an earth worshiper because I really feel like we are of this planet and we belong to it and we were made of it and we're going to, we rose up in it and we're going to go back down into it. And it's just like the worst things that can happen are things that leave the earth, like helium and bits of matter, whatever, or, or humans, whatever. We shouldn't leave here. We all, we're of this ball and everything in it should just stay. And but what if we're not? Yeah, there's that as well, isn't there? That we were arrived here on a meteor. There's fungus or something, right? Oh, maybe. Maybe somebody dabbled with our DNA. Oh, here we go. The Egyptian maybe. thing, right? Yeah, the maybe we got space. space yeah, maybe we got spaceman DNA inside uh, us. Yeah, I mean, well, I do think fun. it's, I tell you something that is kind of interesting, which probably won't make the final cut. But, okay. um, but I tell you something that's interesting is pretty much every animal on this planet does not squint in light. But Except we us. do. Yeah. What do they do? They just their pupils automatically they just look at it. They can just look at it. Now that would be that? right. That that could mean that we're actually from further away. Oh, I see. We're aliens. We're not oh I see. Right. So say we're Where from Mars, Patrick? right? We're from Mars, say, and it's like the bright light, it's further away. Now we're fundamentally closer. It's like, now it's a bit bright here, isn't it? Yeah, but couldn't you like test that theory by having light that's the distance equivalent of what the planet we would be from switch on and, and then our pupils not dilate and then, oh, we're from the planet, whatever. Yeah, maybe. But then it still doesn't explain why all of these creatures on our planet don't blink. Really? We're the only ones? Yeah.
like headlights, you know, when you see an animal, does it go, does, if, you, if you're driving in a car and you see a, like a deer or a fox, does it go, you know, turn the light down, Tim? <laughs> it just goes, yeah, what? <laughs> 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 what are you looking at? <laughs> you should get Ed on your show, on your podcast. Yes. Yeah, I reached out to him like, the other day. He works for uh, Abel and Cole and he's all confidence, man. He's their marketing front guy. Is he? Yeah. He's, uh, he's all about Mr. Confidence because he's got to present their world to people all the time. He does interviews, podcasts. He's their media guy. Is he? Yeah. Sweet. He would have a really interesting conversation. Oh, Eddie's brilliant. Yeah, he is great. He's great. I was thinking about him earlier when we were chatting away. When we were talking about animals. Yes. But you've been fantastic. Is there, really? Is, yes, you've been fantastic, Tim. Thank you ever so much for coming on the show. Do you have any parting words for our listeners? Follow your passion, follow your dreams. Yeah, you think so? I think so. We've been talking about that. That's the theme, and uh, that's how I feel. Yeah, that I'm. I'm really. It was great reflecting with you that I've managed to find something I love, latch onto it, and I think that's. It's allowed us to, to me, to feel like I can do this work really hard, really work hard at it. Not, not for the money that can come. I want the success, but I'm, because I'm following something I love, I won't give up. And that's the, that's the most important thing we should do in life. If you, if you find the specialty coffee remotely interesting, even slightly interesting, give it a go. Get somebody who really knows to brew you something first, try it out. And then if you like that taste, go for it. And it'll be really, it'll give you a lot of um, pleasure and it will connect you with people if you want. It's, it's much more than just a humble coffee drink if you want it to be. So for anybody who's remotely interested, it offers a lot. It's a fantastic experience and the right roast can help guide you through all this if you want. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Tim, you've been a pleasure. Brilliant. It's been really great. Oh, nice. Thank you. Awesome.